Good morning, everybody. How is everybody feeling today? Good, good. Happy, very, very, very happy to be here in the house of the Lord. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that we can be here worshiping you, Lord, giving you glory and honor. In the name of Jesus, we adore you, Lord, and we thank you for everything you do. Receive our adoration this morning with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.
is the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, sweetheart. That was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song. You know that uh, when you think about life and all the, the stories that we can uh, tell of our own lives, the stories that we have heard from other people, you always come to one conclusion, that the most important thing is our Lord. He is the one that is really important in life. We will remember always the great things that people have done for us. You will remember great things about your parents, your grandparents, uncles, and family, friends. Even you can remember stories when you went to, to, to elementary school, right? And some of us, high school and university and whatnot. And those are great memories. But deep down in our hearts, what we care is for our Lord. And that is the reason why we are here. We get together and we worship the Lord every Sunday as His Word declares, right? That we should rest one day. And that day of rest, we will worship Him. Because He deserves that. And that is what we do. Today we are going to study a very interesting passage of the, the Bible. It's in the book of Jonah. And the, the title is, 
Reluctant Jonah, the servant of the Lord. And I will appreciate if somebody can give me a bulletin, please. I need to read some passages from the scripture that are there. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Got one. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. So, we read the first passage in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. By the way, in terms of time and eras, do you know that this happened near the year 781 before the Lord Jesus Christ? That happened. And uh, Jonah, by the way, is referred also in the second uh, Kings chapter 14, verse 25, as a servant of the Lord. That is interesting. Uh, he is referred there exactly in that passage, Jonah, the servant of the Lord. So he was serving the Lord. I don't know exactly what kind of uh, office he had, but he certainly served the Lord. And this is what the scripture declares here. The Lord spoke to Jonah, son of Amittai, and said, let me read on this screen, Nanabai is a big city, and I have heard about the many evil things the people are doing there. So go there and tell them to stop doing such evil things. Wow. So imagine the Lord talks to you <laughs> and the Lord says to you, let's say then. Then, imagine the Lord says to you, then I want you to go to this place and I want you to tell them that they are doing some things that they need to stop those evil things. Imagine the Lord tells you something like that, my friend. What would you do? Facebook. Would you go and, and tell him? Facebook. <laughs> I would put it on Facebook. <laughs> so, and I, and I try to, to put it personal to you because you need to see it how he lived it. It was not an easy job. Anyone will feel exactly as Jonah felt. It's like, I don't want to do that. Now, in your bulletins, there are some areas to uh, fill out some blanks. And the first blank is the word escape. Because that was the first thing that Jonah decided to do. In the verse 3 in chapter 1, Jonah tried to run away from the Lord. That was his reaction, right? I oh, know. I don't want to go and tell them that they are doing bad things. I don't want to go there, he said. So he escaped. When he escaped... He went to this place and decided to go into this boat. And while he is in this boat, and he's there just uh, trying to go away from the Lord, right? Like we sometimes do. You know, sometimes when we are not believers yet, we just know that the Lord is calling us to be close to him, right? You know what happened to me this week? I received a FaceTime from, on, uh, from, from a number that I don't, I don't have in my contacts. I'm not talking a phone call. <laughs> I'm talking a FaceTime. And I thought, what should I do here? I don't know this individual. And uh, what is this thing all about? Well, I decided to answer. But being just cautious, I put the camera facing the ceiling. <laughs> So the person will see only the ceiling where I was. But I was looking at the screen. So I could see the person who called me, but I didn't. She, he, he didn't see me. He was seeing the ceiling. You get it, right? So, and I look at this guy. as an oil-filled guy. He's looking. He is trying to, to call me. And, and then he hung up. And I thought, that's weird. Okay, well, anyway, I don't know this guy. One minute later, the same thing. <laughs> the same guy FaceTiming me. And I'm, well, that's more interesting. So I decided to repeat the same procedure. So put the camera facing the ceiling, and I'm looking at him. And I know I don't know this guy. Well, he hung up again. So I decided to text back. And I said, my name is Gian, and I don't know you, but what can I do for you? And he said, sorry, wrong number. He said that, right? Naturally, it was a wrong number. But then I just felt to tell him this. And I said, I am a pastor. It's possible. Listen, it's possible that the Lord allowed you to do this call so you will have my name and number. 
And then I replied that. So he replied, and he, I think he said, thanks or okay, something like that. But then I kept thinking, and I said, maybe the Lord is calling you to be close to him. <laughs> no answer. <laughs> How many times, guys, we lived that experience when we were not close to the Lord? Did you live something like that? That you were somewhere and then something happened, right? And it was a calling from the Lord to go close to him. But sometimes we are already in the kingdom. We are believers. And the Lord is calling us to certain things, but we just refuse. We refuse to do what he says. And then the first instant is to escape, right? I'm getting out of here. That is what Jonah did. He escaped. The thing is, who can run away from the Lord? Have you tried? I tried. Have you? I tried. I didn't want to be close to the Lord in my 20s because I knew that he wanted me to have a good, decent, honest life. And when I was 21, 22, I became a believer when I was 23. <laughs> I was not interested in, in living a, ri a life that was righteous and correct. I just wanted to, to continue living La Vida Loca. It was fun to me. Right? I was young and I, no, I, I tried to escape. Like many of us do. But sometimes we are already in the kingdom. The Lord is telling us to do something. And we refuse. So our first reaction is, I'm going to stay, escape. I'm going to get out of here. Thinking that will resolve the problem. But it's not. Because sometimes, like in the case of Jonah, the storm will come up into our lives. It's a storm, like he lived, and, and it's confusing. And we just wonder, what is happening here? Or we simply, like Jonah did, he just went to sleep. He is sleeping in the bottom of the ship. <laughs> While the biggest storm and all the, all the sailors and everybody is trying to do something about it. They are even praying to their gods, trying to save the ship. And Jonah is just falling asleep. And uh, <laughs> verse 4 and 5. I'm going to read it directly from the scripture here. But the Lord brought a great storm on the sea. The wind made the sea very rough. The storm was very strong. And the boat was ready to break apart. The men wanted to make the boat lighter to stop it from sinking. So they began throwing the cargo into the sea. The sailors were very afraid. Each man began praying to his God. Jonah had gone down into the boat to lay down, and he went to sleep. Right? When we are trying to escape, and there are storms in our lives, and we just want to go to sleep. You know, so many, so many people in these days, when they are going through storms, the way that they escape and they go to sleep is by getting drunk or getting high or they hide in different things. Sometimes it's not necessarily a bad thing. Some people escape and try to hide in sports or entertainment and they say there is nothing wrong with that. Of course there's nothing wrong with that. The question is is that what the Lord wants them to do? That's the question. Right? Let's continue with this story. After the storm <coughs> came the punishment to Jonah. And I'm going to read it directly in verses 14 to 17. <laughs> the men prayed. Imagine that. The men prayed. Lord, please don't, don't say we are guilty of killing an innocent man. Please don't make us die for killing him. We know you are the Lord and you will do whatever you want. So the men threw Jonah into the sea. At that point, you know, guys, Jonah already revealed to them that he was a servant of the Lord. So, when the men threw Jonah into the sea, the storm stopped, and the sea became calm. When the men saw this, they began to fear and respect the Lord. They offered a sacrifice and made special promises to the Lord. When Jonah fell into the sea, the Lord chose, chose a big fish to swallow Jonah. He was in the fish's stomach for three days and three nights. Punishment. You know, a, a lot of people don't like that word. Right? A lot of people just kind of actually would like to erase that word from the dictionary. 
Let's talk about what happens in homes, right? Kids are misbehaving, they don't respect the house, and then will you remove the word punishment <laughs> in that context? Or let's say they destroy something that is so precious to you, sentimentally speaking or materially speaking. You told them, you, you said the warnings three times. You said, if you break this thing, I'll be really mad. You will be in trouble. You say those things, right? But imagine they disobey. They refuse to do what they were told to do. What is the option? <laughs> it has to come. The punishment, discipline, whatever word you want to use, you will use it. The Lord God Almighty is not unreasonable. I want you to understand that. He is very reasonable. He will reason with you. Isaiah says that. You know that by experience. How many times we had fights with the Lord and we argue with Him? He is reasonable. Right? But when is the time to make things right? He will make things right. And it's not because He's cruel. It's because He is God. He is the master, king of the universe. He has the authority to do that. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that there is no solution for our lives, right? <clears throat> no, that doesn't mean that. Um, I want to discuss with you here with this uh, issue of punishment, that there is always salvation. Jonah prayed in chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. Jonah prayed, Lord, I will give sacrifices to you, and I will praise and thank you. I will make express, special promises to you, and I will do what I promise. Salvation only comes from the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out of his stomach onto the dry land. And that is exactly what happens to us, right? I lived that experience not once, not two times, not five times, several number of times in my life. I wasn't willing to do what the Lord said to me and, and I escaped for a while. And then the, I lived the storms and then I lived the punishments and, and eventually... I got it, and I thought, well, you know what? He, he's right. He is right. There, there is, it, it is correct for the Lord to do this to me. And, uh, and then it's when we pray. And when we pray, we say, Lord, I need you to save me. I need you to forgive me, help me out here. And that is what happened to Jonah, right? Okay. When, when that happened... Jonah was out of the fish at that point, correct? So now he is out again in the shore, in the land. And he decides, okay, what I have to do now is do what the Lord told me to do in the first place, right? <laughs> don't, don't you think it's funny, this story? I just think it's very, very funny because to me it's like my story and like the story of many of my friends you know, I have so many friends that are pastors. I have a network of pastors that we contact every week. We pray for each other every week. And we report what's the status in our congregations. Besides this network, I belong to other two big networks of pastors, and we communicate. <coughs> Out of my mentors, there is one that is a pastor. Very experienced pastor. And uh, he married us, Tracy and I. I love this man. So many times we have discussed this issue about what happens with us when we rebel and we don't want to do what the Lord is telling us. <laughs> and and we, we laugh because we know what happens. You know, after the process, eventually we end doing what he told us in the first place. But it was a long trip, right, to come back to the same point, you know, like Jonah, right? Jonah, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to Nineveh and tell them that what they are doing is wrong, that I want them to change. Is that what the Lord said? This is what the Lord said. I want you to go and tell them that. No, I don't want to go. The escape, <laughs> the storm, the punishment, praying. And then finally he comes back to do what he needed to do. So here we go. Jonah is praying. I mean, preaching. Jonah is telling the people to, to change. And then, as, as when they did that, 
chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. People must cry out loudly to God. These are the words of the king of that place. Imagine like the president today. He said to the people, guys, we got to do this right. And don't, so he was listening to what some people heard from Jonah because Jonah was in the streets, supposedly in three days walking throughout the, the, the city. He will finish him preaching to the whole city, repent and change. <laughs> so people are listening and they are conveying the message to the king. And the king says, that, is that true? Is that right? Somebody's preaching that we need to change. Maybe we should change. So the king says, people must cry out, cry loudly to God. Everyone must change their life and stop doing bad things. Who knows? Maybe God will stop being angry and change his mind. And we will not be punished. God saw that the, what the people did. He saw that they stopped doing evil. So God changed his mind and did not do what he planned. He did not punish the people. Don't you love that? I mean, that, that is the Lord's heart, right? The Lord's heart is in forgiving. The Lord's heart is in just embracing people. The Lord's heart is in, don't, don't, don't make an issue out of this thing. We, we can manage, we can manage. And that is what the Lord does. All right. I want to share with you some scriptures here that have to do with what is the right way to manage grace, what is the right way to manage discipline in all contexts, in all contexts. Let's just start with uh, Hebrews chapter 9, 28. <clears throat> Listen to this. It says, so Christ was offered as a sacrifice one time to take away the sins of many people. And he will come a second time, but not to offer himself for sin. He will come the second time to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. The only way that all of us humans can get right with the Lord, there is only one way, is through his grace. Right? It's because it's the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. His blood dying on the cross. That is what gives us salvation. Is, is what it says here. It's just once. Today we are going to share communion as we do every first Sunday of the month. And we will proclaim one more time about the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And his body being destroyed for our own sake. But we know there is, there is no need for another sacrifice. There, there is no need for a second Christ, correct? We don't have to do anything to deserve the forgiveness of our sins. It's a, it's a done deal. It's done. The Lord did it once. We, we can just rest in that fact. But it says that the second time he will come for those who are waiting for his salvation. I want to give you an analogy here. Imagine there is a husband and a wife. And the husband says to the wife, I'm going into this trip. I need to do something because I have to prepare everything that I, that I need to do for you, my wife. But I'm going into this trip. While I am in, the, in that trip, I need you to do certain things. Please write them down. These are the things that I want you to do. And let's say he asks for five things to do, right? Whatever those things are. So she says, okay. And he goes into that trip. He goes there to work because he has something amazing for his wife. So from time to time, they communicate. And he says, how is everything going? And she says, everything looks good. And then he asks, are you doing the five things that I ask you to do? She says, kinda. <laughs> kinda. Kinda soda. I'm getting there. All right. I understand you have things to do, but please remember because those are very important things. Now, in the meantime, I will continue working, preparing here what I have for you. It's amazing. She says, okay. So he communicates with her again the next day, let's say. And uh, 
says, how are you doing, darling? How is everything going? She says, it's all good. Oh, cool. I would like to ask you, can you send me a picture of one of those five things? I would like to see it. How is it going? My phone is not working today, honey. The camera is not, I don't know what's the problem. Oh, OK. Well, describe to me how is that thing going. Uh, well, it's as you said, you know, exactly as like you told me. OK. OK, well, well, thank you. I will continue going to my projects, because what I'm doing for you, uh, you will be <laughs> amazed. It is that great. Really, really. You know I love you. You know you are my wife. But I have to continue working on these things, because what I am preparing here for you, it's amazing. It requires my attention. But I'm trusting that in the meantime, you will do the five things that you agree that I ask you to do, right? Sure. Maybe tomorrow you can call me and send me a picture or something. Sure. The next day, he's waiting, and she doesn't call. She doesn't text. She doesn't communicate the whole day. The husband was working, preparing those amazing things for her. <coughs> but she doesn't communicate with her, and he's wondering what's going on. So he's there. And in his projects, at the end of the night, he decides, well, I'm going to reach out. He texts her, hello? And she replies, I'm too tired. Can we talk tomorrow? Sure. And that's the story. That husband is the Lord Jesus Christ. That wife is the church. Things that people have never thought of dream of are those who he has prepared in eternity for his church. But he assigned us certain things. He said, I want you to do certain things. The sad part is the church, us. Sometimes we don't even communicate with him. We are short. We find excuses to not prove to him that we are doing what he asked us to do. Do you understand? You are the wife. Rhetorically speaking, we the church, you are the wife. We are the wife. But imagine you are that person that is here with assignments from the Lord while he is preparing in heaven, in eternity, amazing things that you have no clue what those things are about. You have no idea. But he gave you assignments. That is the meaning of he is going to come the second time for the salvation of those who are waiting on him. But look this other scenario. This wife is paying attention to what he said. Before he come and communicates with her, she records a video of the five things that she is doing and send them an email. <laughs> when he wakes up after a long journey in his hotel, wherever he is, he receives a notification. He clicks on his phone. He's just putting his glasses, you know, like all, we all do. <laughs> We can see, right? We put our glasses to read. <laughs> Turn on the coffee maker or whatever he drinks. And then he sees the videos of the five things being done. And that is his wake up call. He looks at those videos and he says, <laughs> this woman really loves me. She is really special. Wait a minute. There is a sixth video. What is this? I gave her five assignments. The sixth video, she shows him something that he, she ordered online for him. It's a blanket, an embroidery is his name, for his favorite chair. And he wakes up and he sees the five things that he asked her to do, she did in a perfect way. And in addition to that, she did a sixth thing. 
this husband is there and she's, he's thinking, wow, this woman is amazing. She is amazing. I love what she's doing. And then he decides, all these things that I'm preparing for her, definitely she will get them. I'm going to do something extra special for her because she is doing something additional to what I asked for. That happens to those who are waiting on him. Those who are waiting on him, we, the church, maybe you, me, we read the assignments that he gave us and we do the assignments the way that he says we should do it. I don't argue with the Lord. He says, I want you to do this, I'll do it. I want you to take care of that, I'll do it. I am trained to obey him. Because he is my master. He is my Lord. That's why I call him Lord. Right? So I am working with the assignments. And some days I just don't have enough time to do all of that. But I say, Lord, but here's my update report. <laughs> this is what I'm doing. So far is where I am. And he says, great. I, I like that. I like that. Things that we can't imagine are prepared there in heaven for us. <clears throat> you know, today we have so much uh, power in technology, right? Right now, at this, in this very moment, there are people that are not just listening to me here in Odessa or Texas, you here in the church, but right now, in this very moment, there are people watching and listening to me in different parts of the world. That is powerful. And it's being done through a camera and some system and technology that we have here in the church. This is now in 2017. We talked about this today, right, in the coffee, how, how technology is changing. How things are going to be in five years. Have you thought about it? How technology is moving so fast? Okay, listen. Things that we have never thought of are those that the Lord has there in heaven. You, we don't have any idea what is he preparing. What is he, what is he doing there in heaven for his bride, we, the church? All right, so are we clear with this concept? We are saved. It's a done deal. The question is, are you doing what he asked us to do. Are you doing those things that he is telling you, please do this, take care of these things? That, that is the question, the real question. Right, but let's go back to other scriptures that will give you a better understanding of this. Psalm 51, you know, many of you know the story of David. He messed up big time, like most of us. <laughs> right? So this psalm tells in different ways how he felt about that experience. But let's read in the right order in order to understand the pure doctrine of grace and forgiveness and restoration. Have you heard the word doctrine? Do you know what doctrine means? Doctrines, doctrine is a series of teachings. So that is what we do here. That is my job. As a pastor of this church, my job is to Hear the voice of the Lord to determine, according to what He is saying, and establish the doctrine of the church. So what are the teachings? What is what we believe? So in Victory Church, this is what we believe. And I will explain to you again. You heard me saying those things, but I want you to understand it. Grace is that we are forgiven, period, right? We are forgiven. But there are some elements in addition that I want you to understand. The first one is in Psalm 51, 17. It says, The sacrifice that God wants is a humble spirit. God will not turn away someone who comes with a humble heart and is willing to obey you. Any kind of sacrifice or anything that we want to do for the Lord is good. But he says that the best thing that we can do is to provide a humble spirit. So let's define what humility is and what being humble is exactly what the Lord sees. 
And I would like you to write it down so you get it in your head. Humble is a person that acknowledges authority. So for instance, we have kids here, children here right now. You are humble, kids, when you acknowledge the authority of your mother. If you obey what she says, you are being humble. <laughs> right? That's humble. Some people think humble is the one who drives the most beat up car, the one who dresses the worst, the one who has not a great stuff because that is too prideful. No, that's not right. That is not correct. You know, everyone will drive the car or wear the clothes or whatever things he possesses according with his possibilities. That has nothing to do with the heart. <laughs> you know, I love being with humble people, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to be all beat up, you know, not, not presenting myself appropriately, because praise the Lord, I have the means to, to buy good things, <laughs> right? That doesn't make me prideful, it's just that I like good stuff. Do you understand? Humble is the person that, in his heart, acknowledges authority. In a company, there are different employees. The humble employee is the one who acknowledges the authority of the, the, authority of the supervisor. <laughs> That's the humble employee. And there are employees there that are wealthy. They are top of the line managers, make $400,000 a year. And they have all the stuff that you can imagine with that money. <laughs> You can buy pants for $300, shoes for $1,000. That doesn't change anything. But this manager acknowledges authority. That is what the Lord is talking about here. He says, the sacrifice that you guys can give me is not something that you can give me. It's when you show me that you respect my authority and you are willing to obey. Like in a house. Kids here that we have here today, or kids that are listening to this teaching, when they follow the mother instructions or the father instructions and they do what they are being told, they show that they are humble because they acknowledge authority and they do what the authority is telling them to do, right? And naturally, it's going to be good for them. If, we, if you follow with me the reading, Psalm 51, 12 to 13, it says, you helped me, you helped made me so happy. Why, why, why David said that? Well, because he, for, he received the forgiveness, right? You made me happy again. Give me that joy again. Make my spirit, spirit strong and ready to obey you. You see that? Ready to obey you. The joy comes by obeying the Lord. And then it says, I will teach you, I will teach the guilty how you want them to live, and the sinners will come back to you. So, and I am I'm, I'm going to share with some people here that are watching now or later in Roku, whatever. I want to tell you something that you need to hear. Is that my my job as a pastor is encouraging people and deliver God's word, but also is my my job to tell you that if you are doing something wrong, you need to change. Like I do with people that I care for. Because that, that is part of obeying the Lord. It's exactly what David said. Are you reading with me? Because he says, Make my spirit strong and ready to obey you. I will teach the guilty how you want them to live. So, the responsibility of any believer is that when that believer, let's say you or me, whoever, you are in a context and you see that something is wrong, you should be able to tell the people, guys, this is not right. Right? Let's say you are in the workplace and some people, instead of working during the work hours, they are just doing nothing. It's your job to tell them, guys, we are being paid to work. Right? Someone has a contract, is doing something, and this person offers certain materials. But at the moment of the 
transaction, instead of using the right materials, is using other materials, and they say, you know what, they will never know. <laughs> but you are there and you say, hey, listen, that is not right. You see? The one who is right with the Lord is forgiven, right? We know that. This is, this is not an issue of grace. You are forgiven. But now he's asking you to obey him. And part of the obedience is that you will be able to tell the guilty what they are doing is wrong. But that's not my place, Gian. I'm not a judge. You are not judging them. You are just doing what the Lord is telling us to do. Tell the guilty this is wrong. Now, you don't need to go with a stick and tell them, you, don't do that. No, I'm not asking you to do this. But it's our duty to tell people that is not right. Like we do in our homes with our children, right? It's our duty to show them the path, and we need to do it the right way and tell people, listen, this is not right. And uh, some people get it and some people don't. You know, you don't, you don't need to be mean, but if you know that something is being done in the wrong way, especially, listen to me, parents, please. If your children are doing something wrong and you know it's wrong, and you don't say one word, that is not correct. Tracy and I, as children, we have heard that all our lives from our parents. That is not right, son. Daughter, that is not right. And that is what we do with our children. We talk to our kids and we tell them, that is not right. You, you need to change that. You, you need to think about what you are doing because that is not right. You are not telling them, I hate you. You are not telling them, you have to be like me. No. <laughs> no. It's your job because you love them, because you want to obey the Lord to, to show them the path. That's all. At the end, everyone is going to make his decision, but it's your duty to, to tell them. What can you do when you see someone is doing something wrong and is not open to discuss that with you? Well, you pray for that person. There is nothing else that you can do. You, but you continue praying. You don't just say it. Because a lot of people say, I'll be, I'll be praying for you. But that is just a, <laughs> a, a way to get rid of the person. But those who say, I will pray for you, is the one that will take time every day and pray for that person. Lord, please show my nephew, show my daughter, show my brother, show my co-worker that things need to be changed. Open his eyes, Lord. Open their eyes, Lord. It's a, it's a prayer. That is what you do when the person is not open to discuss anything with you. And give them time, right? Psalm 51, 18, 19. God, please be good to Zion. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you can enjoy the kind of sacrifice you want. You will receive whole, whole burnt offerings and people will again offer bulls on your altar. So David is talking again about the sacrifices. And then we come back there to Psalm 51. What is the sacrifice the Lord wants? is for us to have a humble heart. Right? Just to have a humble heart. And obey Him. Being willing to obey Him. And that is what He wants us to do. So, I hope you understand here the deal. Correcting you if, if let's say I'm talking to Ronnie, let's say an example. I'm talking with Ronnie and then I say, Ronnie, uh, I think that this is not right. You need to think about it. When I do that, it's not because I hate him. It's because I love him. But that is the way that I should talk to him, right? In, not, not being mean, but I should tell him, right? That doesn't mean that he is not forgiven. He still is saved, right? Because this is not an issue of grace. It's an issue of understanding how things should be done. So there has to be a balance. When you think about grace, grace has a balance. It's, I am forgiven, but I am responsible. I am loved and forgiven, but He is expecting me to do certain things. And that is the question. The question is not if you are forgiven or not. We are forgiven. The question here is, are you doing what you are being told. 
And what the Lord is telling Tracy to do is not what he's, the Lord is telling me to do or what he is telling Rory to do. <laughs> because Rory's challenges are different than my challenges. They are different than Tracy's challenges. So, but he is always telling us something to do. He is expecting always something from us. He is the Lord God Almighty. I mean, he's not a pal. You understand that? Don't get confused that your closeness with the Lord puts you in the same level. He is the authority. You get that? Don't get confused with that. No. I'm forgiven, so whatever. No, 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 no. No. That's not true. The truth is, He is God, the Lord God Almighty. We are His servants. He loves us and He wants to be close with us. Yes, but it's all about a humble heart. What is the definition of being humble? The one who acknowledges authority and obey. You see? All right. Jonah did his job finally, right? He got it. He went and preached. And the, the people in Nineveh <laughs> went into a campaign. They were fasting. For those who do not know what to fast is, it's just you abstain to eat. They didn't eat. They didn't drink certain things for a certain period of time. They were just begging the Lord, Lord, please do not punish us. <laughs> right? Some people need to fast in order to be restored. Do you know that fasting is good because when you are fasting, you are telling your flesh, you are not in control. <coughs> the Lord is my master, not, not you. You know. Do you remember that movie uh, when this guy is uh, uh, reducing a microscopic uh, spaceship, uh, Martin Short and Dennis Quaid in that movie, and he's in this body, you know, and he's so mad at the guy. and said, where are you? Where are you? <laughs> you remember? You know, it's like a, a fight like that. In inner space, yeah. Where are you? <laughs> he says, zero defects. It's, it's a funny movie. Anyway, sometimes we need to fight with our flesh that way. Say, you know what? I'm not going to give you what you want. And they did that in, that in that city, Nineveh. The Lord forgave them, right? And here is Jonah. Jonah was so upset then, the servant of the Lord, right? No, I do everything for the Lord. No. There are people that do everything from themselves. And, and those individuals need to understand that it's not about you. Jonah was so mad because the Lord forgave him. What is this all about? What's wrong with you, Jonah? <laughs> you are now mad because the Lord forgave him? And the Lord argued with Jonah and he said, you really are mad at me? You really are mad? And Jonah is pouting. And that is classic in a very immature person. You correct your kids. You know, when I am with young people, and I correct them, and I observe how they react. If these kids, they looked at me and they said, sorry, and they change, I see that there is a real sorry. But there are others, have you noticed? And you said to the kids, you don't do that, and they look at you. And then the parents say, you go and apologize. Sorry. You know, and they don't talk to you again, and you can notice because their mouths are extremely long now. <laughs> right? The way that they look at you, and it's the whole process of pouting, right? But well, here is Jonah. Like any other little kid. You know, adults pouting is this is just another little kid. Now I'm not going to do that, and do this, do that, because you change this, you change that. It's just it's another childish reaction. But what did, what did the Lord do about this? You know what? The Lord gave him another chance. He said, okay. Jonah left again, escaping, right. Do you remember? Escape, run away, hide. I don't want to talk to you. The same thing. Did it again. 
So he is now somewhere. The Lord allowed a plant to grow, and the plant is giving him shade. So he's kind of okay there under the plant. <laughs> now the Lord killed the plant. There is no more plant. And Jonah is so angry. And he failed again. The servant of the Lord, the one who says, I'm doing things for the Lord. Pouting again. The same thing again and again. Remember this. How many times will you live the same experience? How many times you will live the same experience? You will live it until you learn it. Some people are broke, get the money, get the job, broke, get the job, get the money, broke. And some people are ill, and they are healed, and they are doing the wrong thing. They are ill again, and they are healed, and they are getting better. They are healed again. Some people messed up one marriage, two marriages, three marriages, four, seventh marriage. Some people lose a job, get a new job, lose the job, get a new job. Do you understand? Wrecking cars. Some people messed up in one church and then goes to the next church and then goes to the next church. You see? Do you understand? You will live the same experience again and again and again and again until you get it. You have to change. You have to understand. But of course it's not easy. If you ask me, Gian, did you get the lessons quickly? And I will say to you honestly, no, my friend, I did not. Now it's different. But when I was young, I, I had a lot of trouble because I had problems to understand things, right? But the love of my mentors and my pastors helped me. Teachings like this, when my eyes are open and I'm like, well, maybe he's right. Well, that's good. You use the word maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right? Maybe. That's why I always suggest to people, what if you revisit my messages? You as a member of the church, if you are concerned about certain things, revisit the message. Try to understand what I am saying. Because that will give you more clarity and understanding. You see that? Well, here is John again. The plant dies. He is without any cover. Now he's there. And the Lord says, are you mad because um, the plant is dead? Of course I am. <laughs> Listen, who is Jonah? Jonah is just a human being. And who is the Lord? It's the Lord God Almighty. And he comes so patiently and tolerant to talk to him. Are you still mad? <laughs> Don't you think it's funny? Honestly, tell me, don't you think it's hilarious? The good Lord coming all the way down from His majesty and power to talk to somebody that is pouting. And he's pouting because again he's not obeying and again he's not doing it the right way. Right? And yet, he is there, so patient. So why are you mad, Jonah? Because I killed the plant? Yes, that's it. Now you understand. <laughs> and the Lord says, well, let me ask you something. I saved and I forgave this town. They were 120,000. Yeah. 120,000 people in that town. And they repented. And I forgave them. And, you are, and you are, you're mad because of that. Surely, I can't feel sorry for a big city like Nineveh. What is your problem? <laughs> but here is the kicker. Grace is the result of the preaching of repentance. Some people just want to dwell in the aspect of grace. Yeah, let's talk about grace and only forgiveness and love in the house. Mama, daddy, pastor, let's talk about grace. Where is the grace? And yes, there is a message of grace. But there is no grace if before there is no preaching of repentance. Who represents the grace? The Lord Jesus. Who is 
the King of Kings, caring grace, the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely right. We worship the Lord Jesus Christ, correct? But grace came after John the Baptist preached repentance. There is no way to have grace if before we don't have the preaching of repentance. Because we have to be confronted with the reality, some things are not right. Do you think a kid is going to change the way that he is handling money, or driving the vehicle, or using stuff in the refrigerator just because illumination comes into his brain? No. You have to tell him, no, 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 not that speed. Read the signs. No, 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 no. Stop sign. You stop. Count one, two, three, four. Then you can go. You understand? Yes, there is grace, but you have to hear the preaching of repentance before. And it's a cycle. Not that you are going to be forgiven and forgiven. You are saved. Don't misunderstand me. But it's a cycle just as in a different aspect of your life. One day you are in this aspect, the next day is you are in this other aspect, the next day in another aspect, and the next day in another aspect. You see that? There are dimensions. But you have to hear the preaching of repentance. You, and there is nothing wrong with that. Praise the Lord for that preaching because when we are confronted, we say, you know what, this is not right. I have to think about it and change. Isn't it? That's why it's so beautiful. The gospel is perfect. But the gospel is not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the rest of the books in the New Testament. The gospel of the Lord Jesus includes the whole Bible that has all these stories to show us how the Lord God Almighty sees us, sees life. And He loves us. There is no question about it. We know He loves us and He forgives us, right? We know that. You know, grace is being given, but grace is being administered to us as a result of the preaching of repentance, right? We get that right, so we understand that. Okay, now, once we are in His grace, we should show actions of gratitude. So the kid wrecks the car, right? Or the wife messed up the credit card. Or the employee destroy the valuable equipment. Okay. You have to talk about the issue. Right? Because if you don't talk about the issue with your kid, with your wife, with your employee, if you don't talk about the issue, they will never think about it. You have to talk about it. That preaching of repentance will bring the grace if there is humbleness. Right? You're right. And then you forgive, and like, like the Lord does with us, right? And as a result, listen carefully, as a result of all that is when we show actions of gratitude. It's not that we do things to earn salvation. Who, who said that? I don't know who, he, who came up with that idea. But let me tell you, here in Victory Church, the doctrine of this church that I define is not about that. The doctrine that I'm defining here in the church is very clear. Is we do things as an action of gratitude. Oh, thank you, mom. You forgave me for destroying the car. Hey, thank you, husband. You forgive me for messing up this, the credit card. Thank you, boss, for, for not firing me for destroying the equipment. Now, let me show you my gratitude by doing things right. You see, actions of gratitude from us to the Lord, that's understandable. It should. But you forgive your kid, you forgive your wife, you forgive your employee, and there is no change. And you don't see any gratitude. You are thinking, that's strange. You forgive your kid, and the next thing you see is your car is dirty and he doesn't want to clean it. You just ask him, go and pick up the trash inside of my car, please. There is no actions of gratitude. 
you talk to your wife and you say, listen, you know what, I don't want you to do that again. Forget about the credit card issue, okay? That's fine. But don't buy those things, please, they are too expensive. Show me some gratitude by changing your way of thinking. Hey, boss, thank you for forgiving me. No, you didn't find me for destroying that machine. Sure. But I expect you men that you pick up your tools. I came to the shop and all the tools were all over. That's not right. Actions of gratitude. The Lord forgave us. So there have to be some actions of gratitude. But I'm not going to tell you what to do. Because that is your heart. It's your relationship. It's between you and the Lord. It's not my place to tell you. Do this, do that, do this for the church, or give this, or if. It's not my place. If you are listening to the Lord, He will tell you what He expects from you. And then you show those actions. But listen to this scripture. It is a sin when someone knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it. The kid knows my dad's car is dirty. My mom's car needs to be clean. But, and he knows it, and he doesn't do it. He refuses. That's a sin. And the dad, the mom comes and says, what, what about my car? You didn't see that? Uh, yeah, but I didn't think of it. Lie. <laughs> there were no actions of gratitude. Why did you buy this thing, wife? It's too expensive. I told you because of that issue that I don't want to talk about it, but you are forcing me to talk about it. I ask you, don't buy those things. Why did you do it? Knowing what is the right thing to do and not doing it, that's a sin. The employee not, not taking good care of the stuff of the company, knowing it and not doing it, is not right. It's a sin. You see? It's not that you are forgiven by doing those things. No, it's just, it's expected. <laughs> it's expected. And uh, I want to close with this scripture, words from the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, if you love me, if you love me, you will do what I command. That's the bottom line. If you really love me, the Lord says, you will do what I command. And it's up to you. The ball is in your court. What are you going to do with your time, with your money, with your skills, with your assets, with everything you have? That's your decision. You know that you are forgiven. The Lord forgave you. In your family, you are forgiving. I mean, no matter what, how bad the kid behaves in the house, you know, the dad, the mom, they, it's, it's going to be, lo we love it all the time, that kid, right? But if you love him, you will do what he says. And that is the word of our Lord Jesus Christ today. Let's all, all say together, I am forgiven and saved by faith in Jesus. This year... I will become more spiritual. Thank you. Come on, sweetheart. Come and play and sing that old song that is called The Old. <laughs> the Old what? How do you pronounce that word? Rugged. Rugged. And for, forgive me. The Old Rugged Cross. It's a, written by George Bernard. Oh, and by the way, one second. I want to come to say something finally here. This picture is done by a lady, the Sunday school girl, and I give the credits for it. And I forgot to mention it to everyone. And I thank you, Sunday school girl, for that beautiful picture. Okay, so now let's hear this beautiful song. In the name of Jesus.
one day we will be there in the presence of the good Lord. Thank you so much, friends, for coming up today to the church and uh, be blessed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To our viewers and listeners, we wish you a beautiful Sunday. Many blessings. See you next time.